Well, I want to begin by thanking Brother David for those kind words. Uh, we were asked to write our bio, and I did not put all that in there. So um, I want to thank him for those kind words. But, um, you know, this morning when, we, uh, when he first arrived, uh, Brother Bruce came in through that door, and he saw me yawning, and he said, don't look at me like that. And, and I told him, I said, well, I yawn when I get nervous. And he told me, he said, don't be nervous. You're going to do a fine job. I'm in need of a good nap. So, um, but you know, already in this lesson, I've uh, mentioned two men who have had a great influence on me throughout my life. For these two men I've listened to, they preached to me for the majority of my life. And if there's one lesson I've learned from, uh, and I don't mind to tell you right now that I'm nervous, okay? I think it's important to understand that. And um, I'm sure you can hear it in my voice, but, um, you know, one reason we should always be nervous when we get up here in this pulpit or when we speak to somebody is because we're delivering to whoever we're talking to the Word of God. And when we're living our lives, we're also influencing them towards the Word of God. And it's a great responsibility for all of us when we do that to deliver that message and truth as much as possible. Because what we say and what we do carries on not just in that moment, but in the life beyond. You know, this mentioned this morning that this lessons are being archived. For as long as digital media will exist, this lesson that I'm about to deliver and that all these men are delivering today is going to continue on and be available for those to hear it. You know, I also heard uh, Brother Brown make the comment to someone, or to Sonia this morning, that when it's on the internet, you don't know how far this is going to go. And so, we don't know who's going to hear this. We don't know who's going to hear what we're going to say. And there's one lesson I've learned in my time here at Spring Church of Christ as a member from Brother Brown that's had a great influence on me and, and my spiritual growth. And it's a lesson that all Christians need to learn is the lesson that words have meaning. You know, words have more meaning, and it's important for us to understand that because words are precise. You know, a word is simply a visual representation of a thought. And in order for us to accurately communicate the thoughts that are in our mind to the world around us, we must accurately choose our words. The spoken word is one of the most common means that we have for how we transfer our thoughts from our minds to the world around us. You know, previous to studying this lesson, I would have said that uh, the other forms of communication would have been words, would have been the words we say, the words we speak, and the words that we represent visually in images and drawings. But after doing this lesson and studying and preparing for it, I'm prepared to say that this, another way that we communicate is through our actions. The topic that we're to consider this morning, as already mentioned, is exercising your Christian influence. So to begin considering this topic, uh, in order to learn what it teaches for us directly and also what it implies, we need to start by breaking it down into simpler parts. So the first question that we may ask about exercising our influence is, what is influence? You know, we've all, another great lesson that I've learned in this congregation is define your terms. And so, what is influence? According to Merriam-Webster, a few of the definitions for influence is, as a noun, is the power or capacity of causing an effect in indirect or intangible ways to sway. Sway is what it just simply says. Number two, the act or power of producing an effect without apparent exertion or force or direct exercise of command. Thirdly, one that exerts influence. And then fourth, an emanation of spiritual or moral force. To understand the word emanation, think of the sun. Think of how its light comes from it as a source. It emanates. So what is the purpose of influence? You know, if you want to have a business like, uh, you know, like, like he mentioned our business, Gunner Creative, earlier, you know, if you want to market a business on social media, you know, one of the terms you're going to hear advised is to, or you're going to hear a lot is, that you should get in with an influencer. You know, we hear that term. That's a, it may seem like a modern term to us, but I actually recently heard of that term being used longer in the past. But the purpose of an influencer is for someone to, uh, you know, they have a following. They have a large group of people who follow them, and they, they want to bring you around to their way of thinking. They want you to, uh, they believe in the product or they, they, they like the product that they've been uh, presented, and they want you to maybe buy it. 
You know, the purpose of influence is to sway others to our way of thinking, to bring them to what we want them to do and to what we think is good. So another question we can ask are what are the kinds of influence? Influence is all around us in one of two forms. We have either positive influence or we have a negative influence. The Bible is filled with many examples of individuals whose choices and or actions are an influence to us today. Thousands of years after these people have lived their lives and have gone, their influence is still on us even today through the God's word. Some of the positive examples of influence or some of the positive examples of influence us for good, of course. I mean, that seems like a given. But also, the mistakes that the negative influences give to us, well, they can also influence us for good. But we have to be willing to listen to those negative examples and look for the lesson that we can learn from them. Some examples of negative influence are Saul, 1 Samuel 15. He disobeyed God. He was commanded to destroy the Amalekites. Instead, he took the spoils and blamed it on the people and claimed that he had obeyed God's word. Pharaoh. Pharaoh had plainly saw the, uh, the works of God before his eyes, but he still said, as recorded in Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord. Herod. John went to him because uh, he was in an unlawful and unauthorized uh, relationship. He had taken his brother's wife. And Herod went to him, confronted him, and John lost his head for it. Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they sold some land, but they kept some of it, which is nothing wrong, but they lied about giving it all. They said that they were giving it all, but they kept some of it. Agrippa, in Acts 26, verse 28, having heard God's word, almost believed, but finally made the choice not to. Another example is, the chief, of course, we have the example of the chief priests, the scribes, and the Pharisees. Their negative influence is, has many examples that we need to look at and see the lessons we can learn from them. But some examples of a positive influence. Well, first, there's Joseph, Genesis 39 and verse 9. When he was seduced by his, master, or his master's wife attempted to seduce him, he answered her, How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And he ran away. David, he had a heart and an attitude that was always repentant of his sin. He had a willingness always to repent of what he had done wrong, and he was a very obedient man for God. Daniel, his commitment was to living for God's will, to live according to his will, even if it meant his death. Here we can also add the three Israelites of Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Esther, you know, her influence that she had over King Ahasuerus saved the entire Jewish race so that the messianic line could continue and that Jesus Christ would be able to come into this world so that we all may be saved. Job, as mentioned in our first lesson, very excellent lesson, by the way, his steadfast commitment to God in the face of friends and loved ones who urged him to curse God and die. You know, Mary, uh, Mary, not, I'm not speaking particularly of, jo uh, well, Mary, the, one, the Mary that chose to listen to Jesus when he spoke as opposed to, her sister Martha, who was more concerned about hospitality, who put first things first. But then later we see Martha's good influence in her, by her example of faith in Christ before Christ raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. We have Priscilla and Aquila in Acts 18 who went to Apollos to teach him the knowledge of God's word. And because of their willingness to teach Apollos to step out there and, and talk to him with, when they saw that he lacked a full knowledge of God's word, he went on to teach many more about Jesus Christ. There's Dorcas in Acts chapter 9 and verse 36, a woman that was much beloved by the, women, or the people around her, that Peter raised her from the dead, which caused many to believe. All the people that are spoken of in Hebrews chapter 11. We have Peter, his great zeal and repentant heart. And we have Paul for his unmatched devotion to the cause of Christ. And then, of course, we have the greatest of all influences, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. His example encourages us in love, service, humility. You know, think for a moment what great influence that simple act of washing the disciple, his disciples' feet had on everyone who saw it. You know, Christ's example influences us in dedication and obedience to God's word and how we are, willing, or how we are to live amongst our fellow man both those that have obeyed Christ and those that have not obeyed Christ. 
his influence on how to teach the word, the world God's word, and also how to conduct ourselves in life so that we can achieve heaven as our home. The influence of Christ is unparalleled in this world. The influence this one man had on the world permeates so much of our society that even those who don't claim to believe in Christ are influenced by his word and his teaching through the laws that govern us and just the way we interact in society every day. So another question we may ask is, do we really have an influence? Well, we all have an influence on another person in some form or amount. You know, our influence, whether we intend it to or not, is felt by everyone we interact with. No one can remove themselves from being an influence on someone else. While studying for this lesson, I was reminded of the uh, statement made by Charles Barkley, and I had to research it to get all that correct, but I'm glad I did. But he made a statement back in a Nike ad in the 1990s that said, I am not a role model. Well, that sparked a lot of controversy, as something like that should. But the point he was trying to make when he said that I am not a role model is that children should be looking up to their parents, you know, those adults in their lives, as examples of who to follow and emanate, not athletes and celebrities and things of that sort. And he's absolutely right. But also, another NBA star by the name of Carl Malone, after that ad was posted, said that we don't get to choose to be a role model. The only choice that we get to be as, as stars, the only choice we get is whether we're a good role model or a bad role model. And he's right, too. They're both correct. You know, influence comes at us from both directions. But it should come from the parents. But it also comes from those people that we look up to and admire. You know, for whatever reason, we, we do that. Why, you know, for whatever we, reason, we look up to celebrities or, or athletes or just other people, you know, influence comes from them as well. But however, it's the responsibility of parents to teach their children what is a proper and improper about the person being admired. You know, the Holy Spirit did not exclude the negative examples from God's word because we can learn from them as well, as I stated earlier. I would just add here, you know, we as parents, you know, we're going to be surrounded by, our world is surrounded by negative influences. And we can find the good lessons in those negative influences. And our job as parents to teach, to use those as teaching examples for our children. Again, I repeat, there's no way to remove oneself from the world. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 10, it tells us that leaving this world would be the only way to keep away from all worldly influences. Uh, the, uh, Paul writes, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not all together with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Now I'm not saying it's okay, and Paul's not saying it's okay to hang out with people who commit the sins that he listed here, but rather part of the maturation process, along with the guidance of parents, is for children and for all people to learn the limits of the influence we let our negatives have over us. You know, negative influences, as I said a moment ago, are with us every day, and it's our job as parents to find the teaching lessons in them. I mean, they're there. They happen. Use it for good. Other factors we can observe about influence is that influence is active. You know, influence is demonstrated through our words and our actions. Matthew 5, verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Luke 8, 16 says, No man, when he hath lighted a candle, cover it with a vessel, or putteth it under a bed, but setteth it on a candlestick, that they which enter in, that they which enter in may see the light. Galatians 5, verse 9 says, A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This scripture, and also in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, is talking about how only one man can corrupt the church. However, can't the same influence go the other way? Can't one person be a a leavening influence on this world for good? Well, of course they can. You know, we, leaven has to be added, added to the dough before it can rise. If you leave it out, the dough doesn't rise. In Mark 16 and verse 15, Christ says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. I went to a, a, a copy of a King James Greek in a liner for this verse, and it literally reads, Having gone into the world... 
all proclaim the glad tidings to all the creation. So as we go about our business, we must be living embodiments of God's word, allowing others to see it in us. All right, remember our song, let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. This does not mean that we're to be arrogant or self-righteous about, about being Christians, about the way that we live. But if, we're being about what, what, if we are being what we ought to be as Christians, people will take notice. And that leads into my next point, is that influence is also what I call passive. Here I refer back to one of the definitions I gave earlier, that uh, influence is the power, to, the power or capacity of causing an effect in indirect or intangible ways, sway. Influence is not only achieved by direct words, but it's also achieved indirectly by the things that we do when we think no one is watching. You know, children are always listening. They're like your cell phone. It's always listening, okay? They're always going to hear what you have to say. You're talking and, you know, you, you're, they're in the back seat listening. So keep that in mind. There's an old saying that goes something like this, character is what you do when no one is watching. And it's here I also like to apply the definition, an emanation of spiritual or moral force. Remember the sun. Let's return our minds back to Matthew verses, chapter 5 and verse 16 where it says, let your light so shine before men. You know, I've never heard a light say a single word, you know. But light's presence illuminates. It emanates from its source. It doesn't tell you what it's doing, and it doesn't brag about how powerful it is. It just does what it does, and all those who are around it are affected by its presence. So now let's turn to the word exercise. As, exercise, okay? Exercise, not extra fries, as they say, okay? It's an act of bringing into play or realizing an action. It's use. As a verb, it's to make effective in action. Again, the word use. It's to bring to bear, exert. In this definition, we see more words that need to be addressed here. Bear. It means to exert, exert influence or force. Exert means to put forth, like strength or effort, etc. Exert is also defined as to bring to bear, especially with sustained effort or lasting effect. So what we can derive from these definitions that the, is that the exercising of one's influence is a continual action. It's not a thing that we can turn on and off like a water faucet. The exercising of influence is something that is realized, meaning it's that there will be an end result from the efforts that we put forth to those we come in contact with. So how do we, as Christians, ex exercise our influence, the topic of the, de of the, more, of the hour? Exercise, exerting, rather, one's influence means we expose others to it. If we remove ourselves from the world, we remove our influence from it. Matthew 5, 13 and 14 says, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Something that I realized while studying this passage is that it says, if the salt have lost his savor. Previous to this lesson, I think I would, have, I would have said its. The salt would have lost its savor. But that's not what it says there. And that's, I think that's interesting that it uses the word his instead of its. So think about that later. I also find here a good lesson that we need to be careful in our reading of the Bible. Because it's real easy for us to run over words, let our mind take over in that moment, and we miss the, the words, we replace it with what it actually says. So be careful in your Bible reading, whether public or private. Our Lord teaches us by that verse that it's his children who are to be the influence for the good in this world. Our world is as large as the people around us, and that is where we can start. You know, if you take a penny and double it every day for 30 days, you'll have $5 million. Influence begins first by training the one we see in the mirror so that we can set a proper example. We must keep working on ourselves to be a proper influence. 
Paul makes this point perfectly in Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. And I like the New King James rendering of it better because it makes it a little more clear, especially that last word. He says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Matthew 7, 3 through 5 says, And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? Remember, we want to sway others to the cause of Christ. So we've got, you know, so we got to take care of ourselves first. To influence involves we must have credibility. I think one of the reasons why we look up to athletes and stars and other people is because in those individuals, we see something that they possess that we think we lack. You know, we admire a person because we see in them something that we lack, but we also admire them because in some way we think they may be like us. You know, people have to believe that we can be someone that can be believed in. They want to see that we walk the walk that we claim to walk. If we lose our credibility, we lose our influence. To try to influence others to live a life we don't live ourselves is hypocrisy. And if there's one thing people are real good at finding, it's hypocrisy. So hypocrisy, whether it be real or imagined, has done a lot of damage to the cause of Christ. And when others see a person who claims to be a Christian acting in a way that they don't think a Christian should act, they're influenced to despise God's word. That is why we as Christians must always consider what we do before we do it. We have to be aware of the things that we post and share online because of the influence we will have on those outside the church. Remember, it's called social media for a reason. What you say and show on social media is like talking to them in person with one big difference. It continues to live on. It's going to last a lot longer than that conversation or social interaction. And what you're sharing may be nothing to you, but to others in ignorance, the wrong message could be received. Proper influence also requires that we study. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We have to study so that we can be able to seize the, inf the opportunities to influence others. Uh, Philip, an Ethiopian eunuch, in Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 39, teaches this lesson very appropriately, that we must always be ready. And we must conduct ourselves appropriately to have a good influence. Ephesians 5, 19 through 26, gives us a ready list of attitudes and behaviors that Christians to abstain from, and attitudes and behaviors that Christians also embrace to show to the world. It reads, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So those are the things to avoid. But here are the things to embrace. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. We also must be separate from this world. As I said earlier, we cannot completely remove ourselves from the world, but we are expected to remove ourselves from it and how it conducts itself. From how it conducts itself. We do so by the choice of places we go and the things that we engage in. You know, one of my favorite jokes my wife reminded me of is about a man who went to the doctor and said, Doctor, I broke my arm in three places. The doctor said to the man, don't go to those places. And I like that joke so much because it, you know, if you're, it, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you stay out of trouble, don't go where there's trouble. All right? So it's, it makes a lot of sense. We, com we compromise our Christian influence when we get too close to the world. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 17, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? I'm going to skip down to 17. It says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, 
saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul is telling the Corinthians here not to get too close. You know, like oil and water will not mix, there is an incompatibility between the world and Christians. And I'm not sure if it was a blog or if it was a book that I was seeing, but there was an image that I found in my research, and it said on front of it, it said, separate yourselves. You can't influence the world by being just like it. And that's 100% true. I mean, think about it. How can you tell me I'm wrong if you act just like me? So we can't go to dances and bars and expect people to have people listen to us when we talk to them about righteous living or claim that we live according to God's word. I mean, even if you did have some superhuman ability not be aroused by a person who's dancing or wearing revealing clothing, it doesn't mean the other people there have your same superpower. All right? You know, when you're dancing and dressing like everyone else, you're going to influence someone towards sinful behavior, and you're destroying your credibility in the process. I mean, I love baseball, but if I go to a baseball game and then I post online on pictures on social media of me helping the other fans build this awesome beer can pyramid and I didn't drink a single drop, what are other people going to think about me? So we must also be aware of how we conduct ourselves around fellow Christians. We're not to do things that hurt the spiritual growth of our brethren. Romans 14, 12, and 13 says, So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 13 says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, Shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died? But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. You know, I went to uh, J.W. McGarvey's commentary on this, uh, this passage. And some things I want to pull from that. He says, The idol temples were frequently used as banqueting houses, but for a Christian to eat in such a place was a reckless abuse of liberty. The concern there was that eating there, even though it sounds like a Christian could, could possibly cause a weaker brother to eat there in worship. So like Paul, we need to be willing to put aside our wants and wishes. Even if we know what we are doing is fine, if our actions could influence a brother or sister, to sin or misunderstand what is acceptable or unacceptable in God's eyes. He knew that the meat really meant nothing, but if eating it caused his brother to sin, he was willing to completely stop eating meat altogether. And in my mind, that's a pretty good sacrifice. That's a big sacrifice. So we, exert, we also exert our influence on others by genuinely caring for them. You know, Christ had compassion for those he came in contact with. We have, uh, there's... Matthew 9, 36, 14, 14, 15, 32, 20, 34. My apologies to those writing down scriptures. Mark 1, 41, 5, 19, 6, 34, 8, 2, and Luke 7, 13. All of those verses mention that Christ had compassion on those he was talking to or he was with. And we're commanded to care for others. 1 Galatians 5, 14 says, For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. In Romans 13.10, love worketh no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. In Ephesians, 3, or Ephesians 4, excuse me, in verse 25 says, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. We need to teach others out of a heart of genuine love for them, for their souls. You know, when people see us being fake, they know it. And then they're not going to be influenced by us if they know we're being fake. Our influence is also strengthened and hindered by our treatment of others. You know, feelings really do matter. I mean, think about the song we just sang. It said, you know, some words cut you through and through. The feelings we leave people with helps to shape the type of influence that we can have over them. Matthew 7 and verse 12 says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. You know, the saying goes that people will not remember what you say, but they will remember how you make them feel. And we must remember that this lesson is about exercising our influence. 
So how we make others feel, the impression that we leave on them, is an influencing factor as to whether or not we get a second chance with them. Hebrews 12, 24 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. Philippians 2, and verse 3, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind let each, let each esteem other better than themselves. And in Romans 12, 17 through 18 says, To live peaceably with all men. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9 says, uh, For one another love as brothers, or having compassion for one another love as brothers. Be tender hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. And Proverbs 17, 13 says, Whoso rewardeth evil for good, evil shall not depart from his house. Influence also requires that we build relationships and engender trust. 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23 um, says that, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I, made all things to all, I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Again, I went with McGarvey's commentary on, uh, for this and to learn more about this. And he says a few things I want to highlight from what he had to say regarding this, this passage. He says, his, Paul's spirit of self-sacrifice won the confidence of the people and enabled him to make a larger number of converts. He also said about Paul had adjusted himself to the prejudices and idiosyncrasies of each class which he served as far as he innocently could. He did all of what he did without compromise of the truth. And again, McGarvey has to say about that, uh, it says, though Paul was under no obligation to conform his conduct to the prejudices of others, he waived his own predilection in all matters that were indifferent. But his unbending, unyielding loyalty in all matters of principle was so well known that he does not deem it necessary to state that he never surrendered or sacrificed a single truth or right from any cause. Again, from what we know about Paul, we, we know that he didn't compromise here. Uh, in verse 20, uh, McGarvey's comment, uh, comment for verse 21, it says that Paul refrained from insulting heathens in their beliefs and dealt, with, uh, dealt gently with their prejudices. And also that uh, he did not forget his obligations to the moral law nor his duty to the will of Christ. And in verse 22, the comment was that Paul was universally, or uniformly excuse me, self-sacrificing and patient with those who were over-scrupulous. Also, with untiring zeal for the salvation of souls, Paul accommodated himself to all the shapes and forms of character which he met if he could do so without sin. And then he cites 1 Corinthians 10.33 and 2 Timothy 2.10. We also uh, influenced by the courage of our convictions. Our strength and willingness to teach others can influence the brotherhood and the church to be stronger. Philippians 1.14 says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident by my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, Paul's strength and courage of his convictions influenced other believers in Christ to put aside their fear and to teach others the word of God. Lee Ori Brownlow in his books, Do's and Don'ts for the Christian, says, Stand for what you believe. Contend earnestly for the faith, Jude 3. He says, you lose your influence by compromising because others lose respect for your sincerity. We have no confidence in the person who has no conviction and tries to walk both sides of the street. Exercising our Christian influence requires that we exert it with wisdom. Matthew 10, verse 16 says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. I think that it's important that we work to understand the person that we are seeking to influence. You know, we need to consider them as individuals. You know, Jesus knew the hearts of all men, but that's an advantage that we do not have. You know, Jesus dealt differently with others in different ways because he knew what they needed to hear and how they needed to hear it. Compare and contrast how he spoke with the Samaritan woman and the woman that was taken in adultery, and also with how he spoke to the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, why did Christ blind Saul for three days? Well, I think it's because he knew just how far he needed to go to get through to Saul. 
You know, you compare the, the sermons of Stephen in Acts chapter 7, Peter in Acts chapter 2, and Paul's sermon on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. You know, in each of those sermons, the approach was different because those hearing it were different. You know, Stephen and Peter were talking to people who should have known better. But Paul was talking to people who didn't know the word of God. And by that, he was able to influence a few. And scripture goes on to uh, mention Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Demarius, and others with them. You know, we don't know who they are, but inspiration thought enough to mention them. So why should we even care about influence on the world around us? Now, I imagine at some point in this uh, lesson, you might be wondering, why the hammer? You know, why is this here? And I think that um, how we use a hammer is like how one exercises their Christian influence. One has to train themselves how to properly use it. And we must use it with wisdom and skill. You know, when the unskilled use a hammer, they either use it too hard or they use it too soft. Those who use it hard will spoil the work. Those who use it too softly, they don't get the job done. But it's important to remember that this hammer is mindless, and it's only controlled by the one who uses it. You know, if I'm using it at my workbench and I need to chop a mortise, and I've got to go through, weak, or through some strong, tough grain, and I need to make a deep cut, I'm going to slide my hand further down the handle so I can use my arm and let the weight of the head do the work. But if I need to chop somewhere, like maybe to a line, or I've got some weak, delicate grain, then I'm going to slide my hand just underneath the head so that I have more control. You know, the exertion of force is influenced by what the material can take, the job that's being done, but also the mind that's doing the work. You know, as we go in, as we go, we are in control of the amount of influence we exert. And sometimes we don't understand the amount that we exert or know that we're exerting it. However, we must recognize this responsibility that is laid on every Christian and train ourselves in this aspect of our work. Remember, we are the light of the world. The ultimate purpose of exercising our influence is to, is to Christ and obey his will, is to bring them to Christ, to obey his will, to repent of their sins and be baptized. Our influence will always help someone to move either further to that goal or farther from that goal, closer to it or farther away from it. We influence others whether we actively influence them or we passively influence them. Simply put, in order to have a proper and good influence, we have to lead by example. So I hope that this lesson has been composed in harmony with God's word. If there's any correction that I need for it, I hope to receive it. And I hope it will perhaps influence someone who hears it to learn God's word and obey God's will by repenting of their sins confessing that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and be baptized in the Christ for the remission of their sins and be added to the church that Christ established. Thank you.